is comprised of North Idaho College television students. Your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist, Tony Stewart. Just prior to Christmas, we had as our guest Mr. Hillary Ed Marks, who was the head writer and producer for the Jack Benny Show. Uh, then we had the Christmas holidays, and we're happy to have him back uh, today for a part two interview. Uh, our guest today is the author also of the book, uh, Jack Benny, uh, our co-author of that book. And we wish to continue our discussion about uh, comedy writing and uh, what the major comedians in the past and present uh, have and are doing. Uh, welcome back to our program. Thank you very much. I'm also happy to welcome back the same panel we had last time to continue this interview. Uh, first of all is Bob Brown, the uh, assistant director of the North Idaho College Vocational School. Uh, Mr. Bob Brown, uh, uh, excuse me, Mr. Bob Moe, who is the chairman of the North Idaho College Division of Communication Arts, and Mr. Richard Heinemann, who's an instructor of communication arts. Uh, Mr. Heinemann, at the end of the last program, I believe you were in the middle of a question when we interrupted, and we shall continue that questioning at this time. Right. Um, I started to ask you a question, Mr. Marks, about the relationship between Mary Livingston, uh, your sister, and Mr. Benny. Um, where did they meet? They met in, uh, in my father and mother's house in Vancouver, British Columbia. I was born there. Mary was born in Seattle. But my dad had moved to Vancouver. But he came to the uh, United States from Paris. He was with a, a Jewish theatrical group and his love for actors, and we used to have quite a few actors over every Friday night. And uh, the Marx Brothers were in town, and Jack was the MC uh, at the Orpheum, and uh, Zeppo Marx invited Jack to come over and because he told him there was a couple of good-looking girls at the Marxes. And Jack came over to the house, and uh, of course my sisters were quite young. And uh, Jack made the remark to Zeppo, what did you bring me over here, to meet these kids? And he left. And, ja and Mary never, never let him forget that. And uh, my other sister married into vaudeville, and through that was Jack, and then they met later, and Mary was grown, and uh, Jack fell in love with her, and they were married. Well, did Mary, was she in vaudeville? No, never. No, she joined the act, traveled with Jack because she was bored sitting in the dressing room. Well, w when Jack was in vaudeville, did he do a single uh, or was he part of an act at any time? No, he always did a single. At one time, when he first started, he was part of an act. He worked with Cora Salisbury once and then Lyman Woods, but after the, he got out of the Navy in World War I, why, he did a single. Was he always primarily a, a well, uh, would it be a stand-up comic or was he a... Uh in the song and dance, anything of that. Like oh no, that. no song and dance, and he wasn't a stand-up comic. He was an MC, and he would come out and introduce the various acts on the vaudeville bill. Bill, and well, that incidentally, let me tell you something with Mary about. It. People have often wondered the great situation where Jack, the characteristic of Jack, mm -hmm. that came about when he was quite a ladies' man before he married Mary, and they would travel from one city to another and the phone would ring and it would be a girl. And, Ma and Jack was quite cowardly. He wouldn't tell the girl that he was married. So uh, Mary became quite angry and went over and slapped his face. And with the, that, her fingernails scratched his face. So he didn't know what to do. He had a show to do. So we went out on stage to cover the scratches. He put his hand to his face. And that's how that came into being. Well, how did he ever get her into the act? The girl was ill, that he had a little girl that used to sing, and Mary had a pretty good voice. Not a great voice, but a good voice. Mm -hmm. And uh, she knew the act so well, she had heard it so many times, that uh, he said, try it. It'll give you something to do, and she said, fine. Bob Brown. <laughs> I was just wondering, you were discussing Mr. Benny's background. What was your own background that led you into uh, being a comedy writer, uh, educationally, or work experience, or whatever? Well, I, I went to, when I majored in journalism at SC, and then uh, I went to work at MGM as an assistant director. That is a third assistant director. Third assistant director is a gopher. The last one to yell quiet on the set. 
And uh, I used to give Jack material. And there was Abe Lyman, an orchestra leader, uh, that was sort of a rough guy. His background, that he was a Chicago cab driver. And uh, Andy Devine was on the show. Remember Andy Devine with yes. the gravel throw, with the frog at his throat? And he, uh, Abe uh, Lyman was always putting Jack down. And one day, Andy Devine defended Jack, which was my bit. And the, the thought was, now, just don't argue with Mr. Benny. And Abe Lyman turned to Andy and said, one more word out of you, and I'll clear your throat. <laughs> <laughs> and Jack thought it was such a funny joke. He said, why don't you come on and, and start as one of my writers, with my other two writers, Bill Morrow and Ed Beloyne. And that was the beginning. But I always had a sense of humor. Bob Moe. Speaking of that particular material, that, that kind of creative process, I read an article last week by one of Bob Hope's writers. And um, he was talking about the fact that it was not uncommon for Bob Hope to call him in the middle of the night and say, say, I'm going to Cincinnati, I need a couple. I need a couple. And uh, he would have to come up with those on the spot uh, for him. And then uh, Bob Hope would use those in that evening or the next day or whatever it might be. Any time, besides the one you just mentioned, uh, any times where you've had to come up with, with things quickly, or what is your time uh, sequence um, framework uh, for, for material, or for, say for a full script, or for a one-liner, or, or whatever it might be? Uh, how do you like to work? What's your creative process? Uh, I just uh, like to work, and if the need is to be met, it'll be met. And then uh, the times I remember that we were in Indianapolis at the uh, open air theater, and Jack and I had been down to uh, Cape Kennedy for the launching of Apollo 11 when they, you know, the first one that walked on in space. I think it was Ed White with Gus Grissom and Ross or Chafee. Uh, I believe that was the one. But anyway, Jack needed an opening line. And it was there, you know, and uh, so I came up with a line that uh, first mentioned the fact that we that he was there at the launching, and secondly, he said, you know, I haven't been that ex excited since Alexander Graham Bell he said, can you hear me, Jack? <laughs> you know, and uh, that's, uh, the need is there and the characters to draw from, where hope, uh, those one-liners are fabulous, they're just great. And you need someone like that, but we try to take the situation from Jack's age, his stinginess, a lot of things. Richard Heinlein. Uh, I think it was last month I watched a two-hour show, a tribute to the late Bing Crosby. On that show, um, they interviewed Dean Martin. Dean Martin said that he was certainly influenced by Bing Crosby, as was Frank Sinatra, Perry Como. Um, did anyone, to your knowledge, influence, um, have that type of influence on Jack Benny? Well, Jack, uh, yes. There was an actor by the name of Frank Fay, who was married at one time to Barbara Stanwyck. And uh, he was the one that dressed very much unlike any of the comics. He was a monologist. And he very, it was very suave and uh, Jack liked him, and there was one other by the name of Jackie Osterman, in fact, which Jack took his first name from, Jack, from Jackie Osterman, which uh, he was a monologist. But they had that slow delivery, and Jack knew that if he slowed his timing and his speech down, he wouldn't need that much material. And that's how that, I think Frank Fay influenced Jack a great deal. That was Frank Fay of did Harvey? That yes, that's oh, right. Frank, right. Harvey, uh, that's right. He was the first Harvey. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's did, marvelous. You have a marvelous yeah. memory. Did, um, well, in your opinion, did Mr. Benny prefer radio over television or um, live performances over television? Do you have any uh, preference? Which he preferred to do? Well, I think that, no, I don't think it made much difference to him. Uh, radio he loved, uh, television was back into vaudeville, he was on stage. Uh, I think he really loved giving concerts the way he played the violin. And I think this was really, uh, now he had reached a point where uh, from the little boy of 16 in, in Barrison Theater in Waukegan and, and now coming out with a Stradivarius and uh, giving concerts and playing with Eugene Normandy and with Itzhak Perlman and Isaac Stern and all these people, I thought, I think that was really uh, a great feeling that 
uh, that came to Jack. Something <laughs> that you told students today that I was very impressed with, and that was the idea of uh, why do some people make it and some do not uh, on stage or in anything else in life? And you indicated that Jack Benny had a very special way, as, as all talented people do and gifted people. What were some of the characteristics that uh, made him so successful, not for a short period of time, but for his entire uh, career? Uh, he, uh, when he came on stage, uh, I know you mentioned some of the fact that uh, people felt uh, comfortable with him and felt relaxed and he had a kindness about him. Was that um, the, the greatest characteristic that he had or were the others also? Well, Jack uh, loved to make people laugh, but Jack also loved to laugh. He never talked down to an audience. Uh, there was at no time did, uh, where it was where you could not understand what Jack was talking about. He was aware that the public or the fans or the viewers or the listeners or the studio audience, they were the ones that made that individual a star. That was the acceptance. He was always the man from Waukegan. He was from the Midwest. He had that feeling. He came out in a blue suit. He had a nice clean shirt. His tie corresponded with his dress. Uh, he stood there. He talked to him. He smiled at him. In other words, I think really that in to find Jack and be analytical, he was having a love affair with his audience. And this is what the audience became aware of and accepted fully and completely. And that's what makes you a star. when. You, when the audience will reciprocate that love, then you've made it. In other words, one has to try, and then uh, maybe there's too much uh, frustration and, and too much effort. Uh, one uh, tries whatever they do, and then the, then the people will make the decision in politics or in uh, the theater or wherever it is. Yes, I think that the, of course, this, what we're looking into now, this is the greatest critic in the world. And I think if you're going to blow it, you're going to blow it on this, and it's not going to accept it because this camera does not lie. And if you're truthful, and if there's something, and if you smile occasionally, and, it, and you have humility, and that ego doesn't come through, and you're not going to say, well, I uh, am a big star. You cannot become a big star until those people that are viewing that show make you a star. And I think Jack realized it at a very early age. And uh, I think the continuation of the love affair and everything else just made him a great star where other people, you feel like uh, you want to turn them off. You're tired of them. There's something about it. I don't think, no, I don't think people can <coughs> put their finger on it, but intuitively, there's something. There's that something that tur it's a turnoff. For those viewers who joined our program in progress, this week we have part two uh, of a two-part series with Mr. Hillary Marks, who was the head writer and producer for The Jack Benny Show. We shall continue the questioning with Bob Brown. Mr. Marks, what was the funniest situation that you personally recall during your 35-plus years with Jack Benny? What's the, the one situation that strikes you as the funniest? Oh, Bob, there's so many of them that it's hard. I think one of the funniest was the the time that uh, we had the Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman on the show. And uh, Rochester came in and said, boss, we're out of sugar. I'll go over and borrow a cup from, from the Coleman's because it had been established <laughs> yeah. they lived next door. <laughs> and this is radio. And uh, you heard Jack say, well, I'll take it. Give me the cup, uh, Rochester. I'll go get it. And then you hear the screen door in the foot steps on the gravel. And Jack started to hum. And pretty soon, a coin. You heard a coin drop in the cup. And Jack just said, thank you, and continued to walk. And to me, that was about the funniest laugh. It went on as it started to build, because in their mind, this is a theater of the mind, they could see Jack, it was like a panhandler, and with his character of saying, thank you. You know, and hear the uh, tinkle in the cup of the coin. Before we go, uh, go ahead, Bob. Oh, I was just saying, as I recall, mending the show as a boy, uh, weren't the Coleman's on frequently? Uh, it seems to me like they were on uh, several times as guests uh, uh, on the Oh, Jack yes, show. many times. And then finally that he did the uh, Halls of Ivy, uh, the show. Oh, let me tell you something strange. Do we have time to tell you about something about Mr. and Mrs. Coleman, or particularly Mr. Coleman? I think I was telling you, Bob, or <laughs> on the... Uh, when I worked at MGM, I worked on a picture that, uh, that Coleman made called The Tale of Two Cities. 
and I was a gopher. And so now I'm producing Jack's show, and uh, the first time the Coleman's are on the show, Jack came over and said, Dickie, I'd like you to meet Mr. and Mrs. Coleman. And I said to Mrs. Coleman, how do you do? And to Mr. Coleman, how do you do? And he was kind of a little bit hesitant for a second and shaking hands with me because he was looking at me, and it was, was an intensive stare. Well, to make a whole story short, he left, and the next day he came in early, and one of the pages came over and said, Mr. Marks, Mr. the Coleman's are here. And I said, oh, come in. I said, do both, would you like coffee or uh, Danish or whatever? What can I do for you? And he just looked at me and he said, you can tell me where we've met before. <laughs> and of course, I was hysterical because it was true. I said, the tale of two cities, and Jack came over, and I told him. So he was a big people remember. Even the little minutest favors, and I, I can't, I can't remember what I uh, went for. Probably a cup of hot tea, I think, or something, or a crumpet. Before <laughs> we continue with Bob Moe, I want to uh, inject uh, this in here because this is something that Bob Brown's dealing with. There was another funny story in which he went to a restroom once and uh, took a dime to get into the restroom and all. I think that story is delightful. I think you should tell that. Well, that wasn't a restaurant. That was um, a restroom. <laughs> Yes, I said, I think I said <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> 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 no, we were, Jack was giving a concert in San Francisco. We were staying at the Fairmont Hotel, and we had to leave early and, and uh, catch a plane go to the airport to go to Chicago. And on the way down, the, the luggage was in the car, and everything was waiting, and Jack realized he had to go to the bathroom. So he never carried any money. The only thing he carried in his back pocket was a, a checkbook. That was a security blanket. So he borrowed a dime off me. He went in, and now, uh, uh, as he was leaving, he realized, became aware of, that his uh, checkbook was missing. <laughs> and he didn't have another dime, and he was frightened to leave because I might not be outside and someone might come in, so he got down on his hands and knees. <laughs> and as he was down there, he saw the checkbook, and he was reaching for it and moving in while a man walked in. And of course, uh, the man looked down, and Jack looked up and recognized him, and the man said, Oh, Mr. Betty, you don't have to do that. I'll give you a dime. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Moe. I just recently finished Josh Logan's book, uh, it's the Up and Down Life, Inside and Out, or whatever, something to that effect, but the idea being that, <clears throat> that he did have an up and down life. Several of the other pieces of material that have been written, uh, and celebrities have written, uh, just in the last uh, several years, have shown this up and down aspect of their, of their particular lives. Is it because uh, good publicity agents, or uh, was it just a good fortune in life, or whatever? But it seems as though with Jack Benny, it was it was all up, or at least not uh, any disastrous points in his life that uh, that. Uh, well, that's him. that's true, very true. In fact, in the book, there's an interview that I have with Gregory Peck, and Greg bought, uh, Gregory Peck brought this up. Uh, there were no, uh, everyone has peaks and valleys. His life, there were peaks and valleys, and many, and, and et cetera. But Jack, uh, he never had any valleys. They were all peaks. Uh, there was always someone in the wings waiting, a sponsor or whatever. There was always something to do. He anticipated a happening. I anticipate a happening uh, that I, it came from rubbing it off with Jack. Not that there hasn't been valleys in my life. I don't mean that at all. But that's why that that book was tough to write. So I felt that then it should be judged by a jury of his peers. And I know some of it might be a little repetitious, but it's bringing out the fact that Jack was kind, considerate. In fact, Gregory Peck tells about the fact that it led to other pictures of where he did things with humor from the fact that he was on our TV show. Richard Heineman. Uh, have you heard or seen any new comics that you feel it might have the potential to have the same staying power that Mr. Benny or George Burns or Bob Hope uh, have? No, I wish I had. I'd become their agent. Well, <laughs> well what do you attribute that to? I mean, th these men have spanned generations. Well, I know that's, the, that's it. It's the generations is what's killing the young comic. He can't afford writers. He can't afford good writers. He can't afford established characters. The only one that's come about is like Rodney Dangerfield, uh, where uh, no one pays me any respect. Uh, Alan King went into the thing about putting down the insurance companies, the gas company, because that's on our minds. But uh, no, I don't know of any comic, and I should reserve that and make that with a reservation. I haven't seen that much television. I haven't seen that much comedy. 
what do you, well, if a comedy or a comedian had some new material, uh, where, in your opinion, is the best place to test it? Now, vaudeville's out, of course, and... Uh, well, if they have the opportunity in nightclubs, there's a place in Los Angeles called the Comedy Store. Uh, there's a one in the in Portland area. Uh, there's uh, there's a lot of little areas, and they get into shows and do humor, become an MC, even if it's a, a comedy or a dramatic show. Uh, introduce it. Uh, start to uh, make a collection of thoughts to express that are humorous. Mr. Marks, at this time, let's take a look at some uh, photographs, and uh, you can watch the monitor if you wish to do so and identify these, uh, Jack. Benny certainly knew very famous people, including oh, yeah. most of our presidents, and you can tell us about them. Well, President Truman was a great, the great, Jack just loved it, and he was a terrific man, and, and his Mrs. Truman had a terrific sense of humor. We tell about the story about the last time we actually we saw the president, Mrs. Truman. We were in, Jack was given, given a, had given a concert in Topeka, and we went to uh, see Alf Landon, and then we came to see President Truman. And uh, President Truman said, uh, Jack, let me ask you something that it's very personal. And, and Jack said, of course, Mr. President, what is it? And Mr. Truman looked up and he said, whatever happened to the gas man? <laughs> and Jack fell down because we hadn't used the gas man. That really goes back in radio, you know? I thought that was a funny situation. Here's I'm the only one that's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the next photograph, and uh, we'll let you identify this. One. Oh, that's Fred Allen and Jack with the feud. Yeah, oh, what a personality he was. He was a great, great man, great humorist. He used to write his own, nearly all his own material. All right. Okay, we'll have the next one now. That's uh, Mr. Lincoln with Jack. <laughs> I don't know the other fellow. No, President Truman. <laughs> another one of President Truman, right. And that was the time that we opened one of our shows from the library in Independence. And then later, he had, uh, I think, several times that he was in Washington, D.C. when uh, Kennedy was president, I believe. And oh, this was taken in Los Angeles at the Hilton Hotel. And uh, they had given, uh, they had taken the ballroom away from this boy. They had given, it was a high school graduation party. And uh, President Kennedy said, no, uh, give it back to him. And then he came over to uh, thank the boy and tell him he was terribly sorry. And he has just finished introducing Jack as his younger brother, Teddy, there. Yes, and there's a story. Oh, and I must tell you, do we have time for the one great President Kennedy story? Yes. <laughs> one time, it was at the same situation at the Hilton Hotel, and, and President Kennedy came over and said, Jack, I want to tell you something, that uh, we used to listen to your show religiously. Every Sunday night at 7 o'clock, my father made all of us, the children, my mother, my sister, my brothers, all sit around and listen to your show. And he said, you know something, Jack, I was 14 years old before I found out you were Bishop Sheen. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Brown. This may be a totally unfair question, but I'd just like to, to ask you, which comedy line or situation did you personally develop of which you're most proud, the, in thinking back over the many years? Oh, I, I, I just couldn't, I don't know. I just couldn't go into it, there's so many. Uh, I mean, there's so many funny lines, and I don't know if I contributed them or not. I mean, uh, uh, it was when we sit around and we throw lines, uh, there are funny times of a situation. And I remember that at one time on radio that if you plugged a certain product, uh, they would send you the product. And I remember one time we were talking before the show, and I thought I'd throw it as with the fact that Rochester called Jack on the telephone. And he said, oh, Mr. Ben, it's going to be kind of cold tonight. Should I turn on your General Electric blanket? <laughs> and Jack said, we don't have one. And Rochester says, we have one now. <laughs> that, to me, was not oh, the one, but that got us all blankets. I remember okay. that. I just thought that perhaps you might have you know, something that you would no. specifically remember, like the uh, uh, clearing your throat line or something. That no, you I only brought that up because that was really what uh, started, started working you for Jack. But no, they, it was a collection. It was a collection of other writers. And uh, I think that uh, if you asked the other writers if they were here, they'd give you basically the same answer. Bob Merle. I'd like to follow up just a little bit more on the up and down business of uh, comedians' careers. Even, you know, even Bob Hope. Um, had a slight dip in his career during the Vietnam War, perhaps because of the way that the 
he, the material he used uh, was developed or the mood of the country or, or whatever it might be. Uh, obviously, Mort Saul has had some way up and down as far as the material that he, that he used. Um, what advice could you give the, the young writer or even the aspiring comic? Uh, what pitfalls should he stay away from? What uh, topical kinds of things should be avoided in order to keep from offending rather than making people laugh? Um, any well, along those lines you'd like to I, share? I understand completely. and I think you can't compare Mort Saw with Bob Hope. And, and I think that after the Vietnam War, I think then it was a troubled situation. And I don't know if there was a dip in, in Hope's popularity or not. Uh, Bob has had uh, the only uh, valley that I can think of was, was the situation of where he almost lost his eyesight. Uh, but uh, Hope has always done that type of show. Uh, he gave of himself. Uh, he was very gracious and very considerate. And uh, personally, I just I I like Bob Hope very much. There's a great affinity between the two of us. But I think the young comet today should stop already with the ethnic jokes, and they should stop with what the youth is doing wrong. Because I don't think if they're young comics, they are part of the youth situation. And I don't think anyone should try to tell the other person how to live in their lifestyle. They're going to learn by themselves and through experience. And the only way is to do it is to go out and do a good job, write, establish your character, and stop picking on the young people or the older people or the middle-aged people, the ethnic groups and such and just do good, clean humor. And also stop with this risque humor, because that has reached the saturation point, uh, uh, particularly with me. Uh, this is only my opinion now. I mean, a lot of you disagree. I wish I had a good, dirty book that I was writing. Right. <laughs> with that, we have to bring our program to a conclusion. Uh, not censorship, just the clock. It's right. caught up with us. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Marks. It's been a pleasure having you here these two my shows. My pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest has been Mr. Hillary Marks, who was the head writer and producer for The Jack Benny Show and traveled with him. We've been discussing comedy. I'll be with us again next week. I am Tony Stewart. Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at this same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by a North Idaho College student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time. <laughs>